All right, good morning everyone and welcome to the Stormwater Summit. Thank you so much for joining us for this fourth summit of the series. My name is Carrie Nichols and I'm with Meet and Hunt and I am the PNCWA's Stormwater Committee Chair. I look forward to um, sharing a lot of exciting things that the committee go has going on this year and um, some exciting presentations as well. So first off, thank you to our gold sponsors, Brown and Caldwell, Corolo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetratech, and Kennedy Jenks. And thank you to our silver sponsors, Stantec and Parametrics. So a couple logistics before we get into the um, presentations and such, I just wanna give a shout out to the committee members from the Stormwater Committee who assisted in planning with this summit. Dustin Atchison with Jacobs, who's the past committee chair. Josh Van Wee with Osborne is the committee vice chair. Carrie Simpson with Ecos and Urban Systems Design. Scott Kindred with Kindred Hydro. Ellie Ott with Department of Ecology. And of course, Kate and Denise with Meet Green, who without them, we wouldn't have been able to pull this together. So a CEU poll will pop up during each session. So please ensure you answer the question so we can track your participation. Please tweet your comments during the event at PNCWAORG, and they will show up in the Twitter feed in the platform. We will have a four to five minute break between each session to give you time to move from one into the other. Please join us after the last session for an interactive networking. Uh, we have a Zoom room and you can find information by selecting networking sessions in the agenda. So first I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Stormwater Committee. Um, and uh, what we are. It's a fairly young committee in terms of the PNCWA organization. The Stormwater Committee develops, recommends, supports, and conducts programs to promote the overall understanding of stormwater management strategies, including those related to operation, maintenance, and management practices of our membership. And being a member of the Stormwater Committee provides you opportunities to develop professionally in the emerging stormwater management workforce, including opportunities to grow technically, such as learning cost-effective, holistic um, strategies for managing stormwater. Also networking with other stormwater professionals and innovators, and developing leadership and communication skills and inspiring new ideas through collaboration. The Stormwater Committee is a collaborative team that works to promote the effective information sharing. We organize workshops, develop outreach and learning content and try to inspire others. So the committee is led by the chair, uh, a chair, which is typically served for two years. Uh, I'm the chair for this year, next year. And then the vice chair is supported um, by a committee that ranges from nine to 15 active members from Idaho, Oregon and Washington. And the committee meets each month on the third Thursday of the month from 9 to 10 a.m. via conference calls. Hopefully one day we'll have some back in-person uh, meetings as well. So what is the Stormwater Committee looking forward to? We wanna stretch ourselves. <clears throat> um, and we'd like to be more diversified geographically, organizationally, gender, age, and ethnicity within our committee. We wanna make some transformational changes. We'd like to support the financial solvency of the PNCW organization sponsors and paid events, uh, such as summits and pre-conference workshops. And we, we know it'll be hard work, but we'd like to expand our external communications and learning opportunities, which means more event planning and outreach from a large group of enthusiastic individuals. So just to let you know about a couple of our goals and initiatives, because we know it'll be this hard work will be worth it. We continue to um, promote our awards program, which you'll hear a bit about that later in the session. Um, we're looking forward to our, the conference next year, hopefully in person in Boise. We're looking to plan a pre-conference event, and we're looking to have a track devoted solely to stormwater. So abstracts are really important to get submitted so we can have the most to choose from for that track. We'd like to expand learning opportunities, expand our communications, and um, look for opportunities to gather and network and to help to inspire one another. So with that, I, I welcome you to the Stormwater Summit. I thank you for your interest and hopeful soon participation in the Stormwater Committee. 
I'm going to turn the next step over to um, Dustin, who's going to introduce our first presentations. Thank you, Carrie, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Dustin Ashton with Jacobs Engineering. I'm our global uh, technology lead for stormwater and watershed management and past chair of this committee. I'm really excited by these first two sessions. Um, I think they're very, you know, personally very important to me and the work that we do, as well as what we're really trending towards <laughs> in stormwater management and really addressing social justice and equity through stormwater projects. And, just want to kind of before we start the actual core presentations because they, they have got some really great content I just want to kind of remind everyone you know we really are at a time right now where we're understanding the importance of how infrastructure in aligns with equity challenges and social justice i mean we've seen um, historical development practices that have placed low-income people and communities of color in flood prone areas um, we know when we do our infrastructure scorecards uh, that we find that there is an alignment between between the infrastructure that's in the worst condition with economically distressed communities. Uh, and we know that climate change is one of those areas that really is more disproportionately affecting those vulnerable communities. And so uh, there's some really great organizations out there tackling this challenge and PNCWA is one of those as well uh, through, through this sort of efforts. But one that I look to often is the US Water Alliance, which is uh, they pull together cohorts of cities across the United States to tackle things like equity and one water solutions. And, one of the things they do, um, they've defined three pillars of water equity, and those are access to clean, safe, and vulnerable water surface, which I believe most of us do with our day-to-day -day work in engineering and infrastructure. So I think we've got that covered very well. We're doing it best. Um, but the second one is really what I think is the core of what today's um, discussions are about, which is maximize the community and economic benefits of water infrastructure investment. Um, what we're going to be doing today is we're really going to talk about it at the full project life cycles. So the first presentation is going to talk about how we address social justice and equity in project planning and delivery. But what's really exciting as well is that second one, we're going to talk about how that intersects with workforce development, which gets into the full life cycle. How can we help communities um, through water infrastructures, through stormwater infrastructure specifically, when we're doing construction and maintenance as well in these projects? And then the third one pillar of water equity, which maybe we touch on a little bit here today as well as is fostering community resilience and in the face of climate change. Um, so, you know, with that, I wanna introduce our first speakers for today. Um, so our first section here today will be uh, beginning here at about 8.40 or so, half an hour, we'll stay ourselves for about five, minute, five to 10 minutes of questions at the end, but I'll be monitoring those. Um, but today's first title is Green Infrastructure Promotes Social Justice. Um, our speakers are, we're going to bring back Carrie, uh, this time in her role as a water resources engineer with Mead and Hunt. Uh, Carrie's got a background in stormwater, water, and wastewater design, construction management. Her experience is really all the things. So hydrology and hydraulics, stormwater management, low impact development, all, all of the uh, um, great work that we're doing in the stormwater arena. Um, she's joined today by Annette Griffey, who is the Engineering Program Manager for the City of Vancouver, managing the city's stormwater utility and programs. She's responsible for the city's stormwater regulatory compliance, the stormwater capital improvement program, and all stormwater developments. So she is City of Vancouver Water, stormwater. So with that, I think we're right at our beginning there. So I'm going to hand this back over to Carrie and Annette. Excellent. Thanks, Dustin. And you can advance to the next slide, thank you. So um, communities benefit when social justice is applied to prioritization of green infrastructure, but how and why? Uh, today we will begin, begin um, exploring that by defining a common understanding of green infrastructure and social justice, the benefits of green infrastructure to community livability and what is being done globally at the national and regional levels and a specific application at the local level within the city of Vancouver. Next slide. So what is green infrastructure? Um, we all work in this world, so we probably have a very common understanding, but I'll just go to the root of how it's defined in section 502 of the Clean Water Act. It defines green infrastructure as the range of measures that use plant or soil systems, permeable pavement or other permeable surfaces or substrates, stormwater harvest and reuse, or landscaping to store, infiltrate, and evapotranspirate stormwater and reduce flows to sewer systems or to surface waters. And so for our, our context, 
stormwater management practices strive to mimic natural systems for treatment and flow control as a result of the built environment. And often these are performed as retrofits in the urban environment, which were originally developed with more traditional measures and take the form then of green roofs, bioswales and rain gardens, all of which is referred to as green infrastructure. Next slide. So then what's social justice and environmental justice? We, we hear a lot of these, these terms tossed around these days. Um, they're very important. And so I think having a common understanding of what this means is important as well. So social justice tends to focus more on just relations between groups within society and the fair distribution of benefits. It has a deep history within our culture rooted in helping others who are less fortunate. In the 1920s, governments in Western Europe began to reinforce that idea that all citizens should be treated equally. Here in the United States, we were a little slower to adopt those ideals, um, or at least seem to be a, uh, to align with the European ideals at, anyway. But in the 1960s really brought about a wave of social consciousness with the civil rights movement. So then environmental justice um, is more specific to the concern for social justice pertaining to either environmental benefits or environmental pollution based on their equitable distribution across communities of color, uh, communities of various socio and economic stratification and other barriers to justice. And it was a little later after social justice really came about that the environmental justice movement really came to um, the US. The event that really brought about the national consciousness of environmental justice was in Warren County, North Carolina in 1982, when the predominantly African American community found that it had been selected without community members knowledge to host a hazardous waste landfill. There continued to be a lot of focus on hazardous waste. In the 90s though, the efforts began expanding and in 1992, the offer, Office of Environmental Equity was established. It's now known as the Office of Environmental Justice. And it, fast forward a bit to the early 2010s and the EPA developed an environmental justice strategic plan for advancing environmental justice at the national level. And numerous nonprofits have joined the effort to campaign for environmental justice. Next slide. So what is the interplay between green infrastructure and social justice? What are the issues and where are the opportunities? So the issues surround um, really that, that um, deprived groups may experience differential access to green spaces and associated services, which may be detrimental to their well-being. In some cases, these deprived groups are exposed to environmental risks, while they're also disproportionately more vulnerable to its effects. Disadvantaged communities within large municipalities often have denser population and less open spaces. The photo here is an example from a community um, out east, but it very well could be you know, just, just um, within your community as well. Um, due to the aging infrastructure, these areas can also be prone to flooding and sewer overflows. So where are the opportunities? Um, stormwater retrofits that replicate natural systems to create open spaces um, and green spaces will help to revitalize and promote health within these disadvantaged communities. In addition to the environmental um, benefits of green infrastructure, um, residents near these spaces will also receive several sociocultural benefits. They'll get improved community aesthetics, they'll have better connectivity to the area waterways, they'll have improved air quality. There'll be an increased community interaction which occurs in these green spaces. This will result in increased physical activity and reduce stress. And it's found that less stress and increased community cohesion can result in, in lower crime rates as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so what are we seeing as some of the trends globally and nationally? So globally, the Water Resource Institute, which was founded in 1982, it's now a global research nonprofit organization, focuses on seven areas of um, our environmental concerns. They held a World Water Week dialogue this past summer, highlighting cities that were using natural infrastructure to increase their adaptive capacity to climate change while promoting social equity outcomes. You can find that video of that exchange on their website. I highly recommend going out and checking it out. 
Nationally, um, Congress has a climate crisis action plan developed in 2020, which includes three core objectives. Looking at 100% clean and net zero emissions economy wide by 2050, reduced pollution in environmental justice communities, and net negative emissions in the second half of the century. The consideration of climate vulnerable and underserved communities receives special attention throughout this document, indicating that social equity is a principle that runs throughout the entire plan. So some other um, national trends we're seeing come from different rating tools that are used to um, promote um, green infrastructure or low impact development. So there's the US Green Building Council, which is um, take, which, which manages the leadership in energy and environmental design, also known as LEED, um, green building rating system. And then there's also the ASCE Envision. Um, this is an, the sustainable infrastructure um, rating system. And both of these are finding that we're seeing social equity and social justice being um, incorporated into the rating categories for those two rating systems. And then last example at the national level comes from Georgetown Climate Center. They were founded in 2009 as a nonpartisan research center based at the Law Center at Georgetown, which has some very interesting parallels with Chesapeake Bay to the Pacific Northwest. They assembled tools for addressing social vulnerability, engaging overburdened communities, and incorporating equity principles into planning and implementation with a focus on green infrastructure. They've pulled from examples from cities, counties, regional and community-driven plans that address equity in making decisions about green infrastructure solutions to climate threats. And they come from all across the country, from New York to New Orleans to Portland. So bringing, bringing this all home, next slide please, to what's happening regionally and locally <clears throat> to the Pacific Northwest and some examples of where green infrastructure benefits are being linked to social justice. Our friends in the city of Boise, Idaho work with the Partners for Clean Water providing edu educational resources to the public. In Washington, Seattle has long uh, established equity initiatives um, over a decade and Seattle Public Utilities Racial Equity Toolkit is a process which can be applied to guide development of programs. At the Puget Sound Green Infrastructure Summit Series this past summer, an example of this application was presented on the RainWise program and equity in green infrastructure using core composite mapping and ground truthing. Another example in Washington is where the permitted municipalities within Washington have formed a municipal environmental justice work group and they just held their initial meeting last October. And more information can be found on that at the um, Washington Stormwater website. In the Portland metropolitan area where Annette and I live and work, um, the city of Portland climate action plan it, it specifies um, specifically the diverse community in East Portland as an area where investments are needed, where transportation concerns are greatest and lower income residents are increasingly concentrated due to rising um, housing costs in the city. And the Portland's um, citywide tree planting strategy looks to grow a more equitable urban forest and has, has targeted this region of the city as a focus. And then just across the Columbia River, the city of Vancouver is incorporating equity in its surface water program goals and initiatives. And Annette will share more details on those specific goals and initiatives with a couple of relevant case studies. Off to you, Annette. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I appreciate the background and uh, the history on the social equity, or at least that's the stage for how we implement uh, equity at a local level with green infrastructure. Um, this map, oh, next slide, please. So this map of Van is the Vancouver area from EPA's Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool. Uh, the map shows percentiles of diversity demographics, including age, education, income, and minority indicators. 
from a water from a stormwater management perspective, Vancouver has two main watersheds in the city. Um, Burnt Bridge Creek is our main watershed area, which is 75% of, of the city uh, or 75% of the watershed is within the city limits. And then much of the Columbia Slope, um, which is south of Burnt Bridge Creek is an adjacent to the Columbia River has uh, a lot of high infiltrating soils. And due to the uh, characteristics of these watersheds, we're actually able to target green projects and basins with a higher percentile of equity issues. So using this mapping tool, we zero in on the benefits for the community when selecting and identifying projects. Um, these, uh, the, this particular map kind of wants you to note the in the center area where we have a 90 percentile uh, in the center of the map. This is a case I'll share, share later in my presentation. Next slide, please. So for equity policies, this quote from a letter to city council reflects the city's commitment to equity as one of the factors influencing public works capital projects for advancing city goals for public safety, social justice and equity. So this is a, a, a policy focus for the city of Vancouver. Policies for equities extend beyond public works. Uh, efforts are coordinated and integrated with other city programs such as planning and urban forestry. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into some of the case studies. Next slide, please. So this is the criteria used when developing and prioritizing green infrastructure projects. Each of these criteria has a connection and element of social justice and equity. So for substandard systems and underserved areas, they tend to be older areas, uh, lower income. Uh, so there's element of equity there for potential higher pollutant loading. Um, again, these tend to be older areas, higher densities, and uh, also have environmental indicators. Uh, treatment benefits, we like to look for projects that are in uh, shallow groundwater or direct surface water discharges. Uh, so there's a, a benefit there. And these tend to be in lowland areas and, and lower income uh, for Vancouver. Uh, we also do a lot of project prioritization with our, um, for protection of the city's drinking water. The city's uh, drinking water supply is all groundwater. So we look to treat near city water stations and provide stormwater treatment and green infrastructures uh, in higher density areas to, to um, protect our, our drinking water as part of our water resources protection. Cost benefit for projects. Uh, this is uh, just getting the most for um, the improvement for the dollars spent for the community. So we'll, we'll look at that in, in terms of uh, an element um, uh, of equity in, in as far as making this, the city's uh, utilities dollars go as, as far as possible. For analytic comparison and prioritization of projects, Social equity is, is really key for prioritizing projects. Uh, when the city, city submits for ecology grants, it's a factor in selection for funding. We include um, the percentile map that you saw there as part of each of our uh, ecology grant submittals for applications. And we've actually been um, pretty successful in, in attaining a number of, of grant projects that are in these equity areas. Next slide, please. So this is a case study area, the S&T. You'll notice in the highlighted residential area surrounded by a lot of industrial. Um, this is a kind of an isolated area. It's a green infrastructure project um, with the major grant funding from the Department of, of Ecology. Um, project consists of stormwater retrofits, including bioretention and a pervious alleyway. The project was selected as it is surrounded by industries 
has older homes, some predating World War II. It's underserved for stormwater systems and has shallow groundwater. It was also selected over uh, other similar retrofit projects in the neighborhood as the bioretention facilities were very feasible in the overwide streets and the other projects um, had a higher retrofit cost. So we were making sure we were getting the, the most benefit for water quality. Um, for this particular project, we're also collaborating with Urban Forestry and as part of the design for this project planning, um, we're looking at opportunities for, for tree plantings after completion of the project. It's a holistic green approach. So not only are we putting in the stormwater retrofits, we're also looking at um, opportunities for uh, tree canopy. Next slide, please. So this particular case study is the Fourth Plain Central Basin. And this is the area I noted, as you note earlier on the first map, it's the 95 percentile area on the map, my first slide. Uh, this is a green infrastructure project with major funding, again, from the Department of Ecology. Um, this project includes bioretention and some underground treatment. Um, we had some space uh, limit availabilities and couldn't get green infrastructure in, in all locations. But what you'll note uh, in this analysis is that um, not only were we looking for um, the area with the uh, social equity as part of this and uh, some of our other criteria, we also really targeted with this analysis um, the untreated, undetained areas in which, which were most underserved um, as this area is uh, directly discharges to Burt Bridge Creek. So it was uh, looking for those that were more ideal for, for, for benefit for treatment and green infrastructure. So next slide. So this map shows the analysis that was, um, the result of the analysis that was conducted from the previous map and uh, shows the areas that, that uh, were targeted for treatment uh, where the most benefit and value could be directed. So these are the areas that are older, older roads that have direct stormwater connection to a 60 inch outfall that goes directly into Burbridge Creek. Next slide, please. So as part of the equity um, process, I guess, we, we also look towards a lot of communication and outreach with our projects. And it's important to actively engage community members in the process, of planning and developing green infrastructure projects. This creates long-term success for the projects. Uh, in disadvantaged neighborhoods, this can require a modified approach to standard community out outreach efforts, uh, yet it's, it's really worth the effort. Green infrastructure is an important tool in creating more equitable environmental enhanced cities. It's also important um, when looking at the community outreach uh, and engagement to uh, carry it through design and the construction phase. Um, we have a lot of flyers we provide. We also look at uh, the community as a whole and, and look at um, the uh, languages, uh, different, different uh, outputs for flyers in, in, in different languages. So what, uh, what really we look for in prioritizing for green infrastructure I think um, is really a, a benefit that uh, Haley Falconer, President uh, PNCAWA said, which was uh, to boldly envision and a sustainable and equitable future. I have any, any questions? Um, Annette, I think we're gonna save questions for the very end, but I, I know okay. the, Larry Matson has one, but we'll, we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Thank you. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Was that the last slide? My apologies, Annette. Um, yes, so we do have a, a question from the group and I want to remind everyone that please, um, because the audio is just us on the panel, um, please type your questions into the chat line. But we have a question from Larry Matson, uh, and this is likely for either one of you, but uh, did Vancouver use a scoring matrix or similar approach to evaluate and prioritize projects? Mm -hmm. We haven't um, used a, a, a matrix per se. It's just more the use of the criteria. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carrie, do you have any examples as well or? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely use the map that Annette shared at the beginning to you know, help to put that as a layer of prioritization, right? So we've got all sorts of factors that, that we look into um, where I, sh I should say Annette really looks into where she targets her um, her retrofit program, and that's just another a layer in that project identification. Great. Um, and now um, we have another question here. This is from Claudia Sterling. Um, would would appreciate a link to the EPA mapping tool displayed. Uh, do you think you can share that with the group? We sure can. Uh, yeah. Uh, quickly, it's just a uh, EJ screen dot epa.gov forward slash mapper but I will I will share that that's great um, I had a few questions to prompt a little further discussion because I know that you didn't have as much time community outreach is such you, you covered that a little bit with the Brilliant for drive project maybe we can dig into that a little bit further because it's such a core part of meeting equity on these projects um, can you share with us any any specific methods that you use to reach diverse communities? I mean, I think you know we found that you know you know public workshops are met by one portion or easy to attend by one group of the community, but there are other parts of the community that might not attend those. So, how do you get equitable outreach uh, to the communities you're working with? Do you have any lessons learned there? Well, some of our lessons learned actually are coming through our um, source control inspection program. So we're we're getting out into the community um, and understanding better the, the nature of who we're talking to within within an area so we can we can better target that so that when we do put out uh, flyers or, or information we make sure that we have the the uh, correct uh, include correct translations of course we, we we target it from from all aspects we have a website we we have workshops one of the things with the workshops i really like to do is to put maps out on tables you know same map out on the table because people people can you know it's doesn't require interpretation a lot of times and people like to draw on those and i get it's really kind of nice because you get a, a good diversity in young to old as well uh, sharing ideas and and uh, sharing information that's great. Um, a couple more questions come in here. Um, Ann McDonald um, from Clean Water Services. Did you try to get demographic information with finer spatial resolution than census tracts? How did you do this? I think you did. Well, we are actually looking at that more closely with our GIS folks. I can have, um, refer you to that. There, there is quite a bit of information available on the um, EPA website. Um, so it, it just it just depends upon how you what you're looking at and how you want to use that um, because there's uh, environmental indices, there's demographic indices. So it just depends upon you know what what you're looking at uh, in that regard. but we're, we're also looking at um, incorporating that into our GIS, which would then be more of a uh, a little different uh, approach and maybe an easier approach to identify those areas that uh, would would you know benefit best because we'd have our storm system as well as that that coverage. Great. Um, and then another question from Clara Olson from Parametrics. Have you noticed community outreach changing to adapt to COVID? Well, we're just on the forefront of launching quite a few grant projects. So we haven't had that experience <laughs> yet. So um, we, 
we kind of had a, a few projects that um, we, we were hoping would, would get through the COVID, but uh, I probably will be finding out here in a, in a month or so. Yeah, we had talked about doing um, coffee shop sort of smaller outreach with um, for a project upcoming that we're going to be pivoting to that postcard approach. Um, so I think we're seeing a little bit of it for sure. Yeah, Continue it definitely retooling. will have an impact. For sure. And I've seen a lot more use of online surveys and, and some sort of that data. So, you know, in some ways it's an enhancement because it really get more geographic knowledge there and you can meet people's schedules better. But I think... I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of that because I think there's a lot of lessons learned that'll actually enhance our post-COVID outreach as well. Um, the online portal can be, you know, a little challenging too for some of the underserved communities. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think getting creative and different types of, of um, you know, also leveraging maybe other community groups too is going to be our, our, our benefit or our ally there. Great. Uh, another question here from Kristen, Krista Rinninga from Brown and Caldwell. Were there changes made to the project as a result of outreach that were not originally anticipated? And I'll add on to that <clears throat> a follow on question, which is what is the role of community and decision making on these projects? Yes, <laughs> there have <laughs> been. <laughs> And um, it's a really difficult, it's a good question. Thank you, Krista, but it's a, it, it, it sometimes it's project dependent. So it, it definitely, it does have an effect. We have made changes um, very specifically in, in regards to um, uh, a number of our, our, our projects. Um, and, um, you know, it, when you're doing bioretention, it's in your front yard. So people have various opinions and, and the intent is to make sure that we get every, you know, the water clean. So if we can do that in an area that's more conducive for the neighborhood and for the, the neighbors, then, then we will look towards that. So that, that's probably the, the best example that I would have. Yep. And on that question of decision-making, um, do you give the communities or how do you frame that up for communities, what they can influence on projects? <clears throat> Excuse me for my voice. Did you catch that last little bit? But they can influence yeah. on projects. Um, it's it's usually through um, just the the outreach process and the communication process and and people. Um, you know, we we look towards people that are really. You know, we have a lot of people that are very supportive. A lot of and and then. I shouldn't say a lot, but there are some that aren't as, um, they might be supportive of the project, they just don't want it in front of their house, you know, how that is. So uh, we, we hear from, from folks, we, we try to get a, a outreach to specific outreach and, and prior to COVID visitation with the, um, directly with the homeowners for those that are, are directly, uh, more directly impacted by the changes within, within the street. And we've so, talked a lot about focusing on um, ed the educating about the benefits of these facilities and getting that buy-in from the, the start. Great. And it's fine tuning where they, the facilities get placed. Great. Well, I, and we're at the end of our term here um, and we're gonna take a break here at 9.10 and come back at 9.15. So here we can do a bio break, check on things that are in our house. I've got a dog that's just about ready to start barking. Um, there's a couple of notes on here. Keith, uh, thank you for making this notes. Your questions do not show up if you have full screen set up. Um, and for those who uh, need CEUs, uh, there's been some polls that pop up um, for that. Um, additionally, uh, Keith, you've got questions about what about long-term maintenance of the projects. And that's a great transition for the afternoon, this 915 section. Um, Jesse Williams and Carrie, no, um, Carrie Simpson will be sharing uh, some, some areas in that space. So why don't we come back at 9.15? Uh, and again, let's thank uh, Carrie and Annette for the great uh, presentation and lots of great information. I'm sure they're very happy to follow up with anybody if they have any follow-up questions. So uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you all in about five minutes. Thank you. Great. Thanks.